When I was a kid, there was no streaming services. There was no torrents, there was no Apple Music, there was no Spotify. If you wanted to steal a CD, you literally had to go into HMV or Walmart and actually shove it in your shirt and walk out. Kids today just don't know how easy they have it. I didn't actually steal anything as a kid, but you get the point. So instead what I would do is I would actually go to the library, the public library in my town, and rent a stack of CDs. There was no real system to my choosing of these albums. I would just choose them based on how cool the graphic design or the artwork was on the front cover. I'd go home as a kid and sit in my bedroom, cross-legged on my floor, just listening track by track through the entire album. Back then there was no previews. You couldn't check the album out before you bought it. You just had to hope for the best. On one such occasion, in this stack of CDs that I brought home, I pulled out this CD with this white cover. And honestly, it looked like a bad corporate PowerPoint presentation. There's this kind of off-center, blurry, kind of faded Polaroid looking picture of this guy sitting on the bumper of a van with his head down, kind of his face obscured, with this like cowboy looking hat, playing guitar in cowboy boots, and then there's this horrible sort of handwritten typeface that said, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble and the name of the album was The Sky Is Crying. Honestly, it wasn't that promising an album. Just from the cover alone, I'm surprised I even listened to it at all. But when I put it in, I hit play, my jaw fell to the floor. I had not heard anything like this in my young, whatever, 12-year-old life and it blew my mind. If you talk to any guitar player, this is kind of a recurring story that happens to everybody. They, all described a similar experience hearing Steve Ray Vaughan for the first time. And at the time, I didn't really know what was happening from a technical perspective, but I knew that this was absolutely the way that guitar should be played, and there's something visceral and intense and beautiful about what he was doing on the instrument. There was just something in the DNA of the notes he played and the way he attacked them that was so inspiring to me and to millions of others that followed. Now, I think to really appreciate Stevie and to have a true appreciation of what he did you're gonna have to go down a bit of a nerdy path with me, so just bear with me, non-musicians. I gotta get this out of my system. I promise there is a reward to this. So I think even if you're not a musician, you probably have some understanding of the kind of guitar Stevie played. It was called a Stratocaster. And if you're a guitar player, you're very familiar with what a Stratocaster is, but that's not my point. The point is, he played a gauge of strings called 13s in guitar parlance. What are 13s? What does that even mean? So a gauge, I guess, refers to the thickness of a string in decimal fractions of an English inch or something like that. So when you hear a guitar player say, I play tens, that's a description of the thickness of the string. So the very thickest string, the E string, the very closest one to your face is 0.01 inches thick. So just for reference, most guitar players play nines or tens and Stevie played 13s. So every gauge you go up, gets exponentially more difficult to bend and to play. So Stevie had a bunch of different guitars, but he had two really infamous ones. One called Number One and one called Lenny. And both of them were strung up this way. You can't talk about Steve Ray Vaughan unless you talk about action too. So what is action? Okay, well action, this is not a Stratocaster, it's a Telecaster. The action is how high off of the fretboard are the strings. And again, the higher they go, the more difficult it is to play. And Stevie liked it super high for a lot of reasons. So up here at the 12th fret, I don't know the exact measurement, but for me, it would be a near impossibility to make a bend and get to another note. You would be exhausted trying to play what he did on eights, let alone 13s, unless you're Josh Smith or some other savage with big beefy hands who can really do it. Okay, bear with me. One more thing for the nerds. So when Stevie was recording his last studio album called In Step with his band Double Trouble, he had 32 different amps that he used on that record. Like a 1962 Fender Twin, a 1959 Mint Fender Bassman, a vintage Fender Harvard, a Magnetone, a Vibroverb, a Dumble Steel String Singer, and a bunch of other Fenders and Marshalls. He used a lot of interesting weird techniques according to sort of the guitar player lore, uh, but I'm digressing. Let's get back to it for those non-guitar players. I watched his Easter Seals telethon performance the other day, and if you don't know, Easter Seals it's like a charity thing they do in Canada. I'm not really sure the details, but I think it's for kids. It, not the point, anyway. It's hilarious watching this juxtaposition of him just sweating and gyrating on stage, shredding behind his back in like a, this fiery rendition of a Hendrix tune, Voodoo Child, and then cut back to these hosts who then have to be normal after watching him just having lit the stage on fire. Great. <laughs> we gotta hear more of that later. 
I'm imagining too those poor people in the front row who got maybe free tickets who didn't know who Stevie was, just thought like, ah, this is something to do on a Friday night. And then not knowing that Stevie had a propensity of cranking his amps up and then just having their heads sheared completely off in the front row. Uh, I wish I was there. Just for context, Stevie didn't think 100 watt amps were enough, so he had Dumble, the famous amp company, build him a 150 watt amp. So RIP, all those people in the 80s eardrums. That's like saying like, oh, my 787 Dreamliner jet engine isn't loud enough. I need you to make it 50% louder. So there you are, just sitting in the front row, completely unaware that you're about to have your face melted off by this guy dressed like a Texas cowboy genie. And it really made me think about how unique and how different Stevie really was in that era. And it, can that really exist ever again? Yeah. Imagine, you know, like New Year's Eve, Dick Clark's Rockin' Eve, hosted by Ryan Seacrest, and the main event isn't Kesha, but it's some blues act. That would never happen. And they just let him shred and play fuzz pedals on live TV for like 11 minutes straight. I can't imagine it. He's playing behind his back. I'm surprised he didn't actually start smoking like he did on some other occasions. Can anyone ever really be this unique again? I see people trying, but it's like he defined an entire genre. You can't talk about blues without mentioning Steve Ray Vaughan and the impact he had. When you first hear that fast Steve Ray Vaughan lick, you don't know what it is, but you want it. You want to put that thing in your tool bag and you want people to know that's like a milestone. You're like, I can play that. You know, and to other guitar players, it's like, owning a Honda Civic. Nobody's impressed that you have a Honda Civic. Sure, it's a reliable, nice, decent car, but everybody's like, yeah, it's a Honda Civic, but the guy who made the Honda Civic, everybody knows that guy. Stevie was one of those just rare humans who couldn't have been anything but what he became. He came from a hard upbringing and he was playing music essentially to save his life. There was no posting to Instagram, no PR stunts, no blog posts, no whining. He was just a unique guy. If you ever hear him in interviews, it's hilarious. This is just like the true epitome of a rock star who just didn't take any crap. Such a manly guy too. If you check him out on the Howard Stern show, you know, most people might be starstruck being on such a big show. But I think at one point Stern asks him like, how much he got paid for a gig? And Stevie's just like, none of your business, moves on. It's hilarious. It's just like, he was so genuine and just so himself. It's so refreshing to see a guy who didn't care about anything except the music. He's just this fusion reactor of artistry and soul that is impossible to replicate. It would be completely inauthentic if I tried to dress like Stevie Ray Vaughan or for most of us if we did. If you wear a cape, you're probably gonna get punched and rightly so. But if I was on stage every night transmuting air into brilliant virtuosic performances, I think I could probably also wear beads and a cape or whatever. I mean, the prolific and near fatal cocaine habit that he had might have played a factor in his wardrobe choices, but I choose to think it was a former. Now I heard a story and I don't know if it's true, but I'm just gonna repeat it and then spread it all over the internet because that's how the internet works. But I heard a story when he played this really famous show at the Elma Combo here in Toronto, that he was backstage in the green room and nobody could wake him up from drugs or heavy sleeping, I don't know, the real story. I'll let you figure it out, but nobody could wake him up. And then when he did finally wake up, he just kind of came to his senses, walked out the door. Rene Martinez, his guitar tech, handed him his guitar, and he went on to play one of the most legendary, famous shows of his entire career at the Elmo Combo. That's just the kind of guy that Stevie Ray was, just ready at a moment's notice to be amazing. But, like all good things, it must come to an end. Monday, August 27th, 1990. So Stevie and his band were playing as guests at the Alpine Valley Musical Theater in East Troy, Wisconsin. So they're playing on the stacked bill, Eric Clapton, Buddy Guy, Robert Cray, his brother's band, Jimmy Vaughn, a whole host of these amazing blues musicians. And so their gig ended and it was time to go. It was around 1 a.m. and they had four helicopters waiting to transport the band back to Chicago that night. The plan was to go and Peter Jackson, I think his name was, Clapton's tour manager, ran in and was like, guys, we gotta go. The weather's getting worse. Four helicopters, split it up, jump in, let's head out. And as fate would have it, I don't know if they miscalculated the number of seats, but when Stevie went to board, he was gonna get in the helicopter and noticed there's no space. And so he asked one of Clapton's tour crew, hey, can I jump in there? Can I take your spot? I really gotta get back tonight. And so they're like, all right, sure. And they let him in. And his last words before taking off to his 
His drummer was, I love ya. And off they went. So they took off at 1 a.m. in dense fog. Terrible idea. And in 0.6 kilometers, that Bell 206B Jet Ranger into the side of a ski hill, killing everybody instantly. And that's it. That's an entire musical legacy gone in one moment. Just ceased to exist forever. Maybe the good die young, you know? The Lennons, the Cobains, the Joplins, the Hendrixes. And maybe this was just a horrible, tragic bookend to his life and his career that had to be. Maybe, you know, he would have ended up like Ringo Starr. Do you know what Ringo Starr is doing these days? Neither do I. Maybe he would have faded into obscurity. Maybe the coke habit would have gotten him and he wouldn't be remembered as the most incredible blues musician of all time otherwise. <sighs> Either way, it makes me sad that I'm never gonna get to see him live. They just don't make him like they used to. Fortunately, we have bootlegs, we have tons of recordings that people are gonna continue to dissect and to discuss for generations to come. So thank you, Stevie. You have shaped the guitar playing of millions of guitar players and affected the lives of many other non-guitar players. If you're not familiar with Stevie's stuff or his catalog, uh, I'll link some of his cool performances and some of the ones I talked about in this video below um, so you can check it out. Sort of the Stevie Ray Vaughan primer, the Stevie 101, so hopefully you can also appreciate what I have appreciated about his playing and his character. This should definitely get you started going into that rabbit hole. So check it out with an open mind. You'll see, I think, what millions of other people have found in his playing. And if you really want to go deep and go way down the rabbit hole, pre-order his new biography coming out, Texas Flood, The Life of Steve Ray Vaughan, or something like that, I think it's called. Uh, I wish I was sponsored by them. Sadly, I'm not. Um, but it should be interesting. Apparently it's got some really off the record stuff that nobody's heard before from his bandmates. So check it out. You're gonna love it. I'll see you next time.